Okay, so let's continue with uh, the rest of the page for Japan. I have shared some images for food today. And uh, later on, I'm going to also share some an article on uh, Japanese traditional prints and the meanings behind them. It's really wonderful. And it's an exhaustive article. You could just make a little booklet of um, those prints um, and it will become like a 30 page booklet, but it will be a very interesting thing to keep. So I'm going to try and make one of those prints also so we can include that in today's session. Okay, so here's where we are, and believe me, I was itching to complete this, but I thought I should uh, wait for class today so I can show you how I would make this um, pop even more. We managed to do just about one layer of colors. Um, and um, so, when, you, when we say one layer, it is obviously not necessarily one continuous layer. We painted this outside first, put in a few colors here and there, waited and then put the next color. But all of it, when it comes to the first layer on the paper, that becomes layer one. Now we will start adding depth to this. Um, some of this depth can be added with just... Um, a shade of the same color or we can change the color and make it deeper and use maybe a contrasting color to make it look more robust. So the if you use the same color to make a darker shade, it often lands up becoming a little flat. So I tend to use something that is slightly different or could be in complete contrast to what we have in this case. Before we go there though, I want to finish this sign board here. And it's a gray sign and it's painted in reverse. So last week we had made the, uh, the lettering. So this week I'm going to go over some of that lettering. There are four letters on top. I guess for kanji. So I'm they're too tiny for me to make that design. So I'm just making representative blocks. And then I'm going to paint around. Now notice that my paint is really wet. And this is just a mix of gray, uh, sorry, black, and whatever color was around. And it's light or wet enough for me to keep painting a detailed illustration. Oops. And hopefully the edges will not dry up too fast. Now, whenever making letters, you must be extra careful that you're not writing something wrong. No? So each little shape should be carefully noted down. I've often found that when you make illustrations like these, the lettering part can make your pictures look quite cute. And also fairly impressive.
Now, if you want, you can also put in the red color before you paint everything black. I don't know what that thing is. It just looks like a stain. Maybe it's like one of these, uh, like we put kung ku on everything. It could be one of those things. In the photograph, this board, signboard looks rather worn out. So we can make this grayish if you want. The red on the side is a stamp. Yeah, the two dots, right? Yeah, the one, yeah. So those squares. look like stamps. But this thing in the center, I don't know what it is. Yeah. Well, my red dots are going to become black because I was impatient. No stamps for me. Okay, so I'm going to leave it like this and move to some other colors. Now we can just use a cobalt blue or even a cerulean blue or a mix of the two. This is cobalt. It's, it's got a slightly deeper shade, so I'll have that available in where we want. A darker shadow and the cerulean would be a lighter shadow. The first place to make shadows with cobalt blue would be on the roof tiles. So just using a medium sized brush, you can make lines at any one side of the roof and we've made this illustration reasonably oh, casual it's not too detailed so even these lines need not be terribly accurate because if they fall short of some detail it becomes instantly visible so in some places they're close to the line, some places they're between the lines. Allow for a little inconsistency. Now the same color, maybe you can add a little burnt umber to this, same blue, to make it a slightly dark, warm dark, shadow carefully paint around these square blocks keep your paint wet if you're sitting under a fan reduce the fan speed just for this bit because we want to keep this color a little light uh, wet for longer so just deposit some co uh, color as you finish painting and then with a damp brush it's not wet it's just damp just drag this color down
So where the color has dried, add more color. Hopefully it won't damage too much. All right. Now the same process we do behind these curtains as well. So you will get, uh, when you pull the color down, you will get uh, a shade. Your shade does not have to be the same on both levels. You can use a different color also. So in this case, I'm using black. And again, the process is the same. The deeper part of the color would be higher. And uh, you drag it lower. Oh, you have actually taken black, Aditi? Yeah, this is now just black. Okay. And these curtains also are black, but they are worn out. So they you won't um, uh, you don't need to show them as black. Here I have more room, so I'll be able to show that transition to you much better than on top. This way now the curtains will pop, and we can use this whatever little black we have or take a small brush and make a little bit of black between and behind the curtains. So they will look like they have a shadow. This will again add some dimension. So any one, uh, any two sides you can make the shadow. It does not have to be on both sides. Now here, obviously you can see that the black shadow has just gone through and through so i'm adding one more line while the paint is still wet to the top to just add an extra shade because my merging was i think a little too efficient everything just got fully merged this is slightly better so you need to have those difference um difference in the shadow also even on top, I can do the same thing. So at any point, you need to fix part of your illustration, you will have opportunity to layer. Okay, take a little grayish wash, again, a residual wash across this sign also. And we'll come back to all of this in a bit. Oh, we can also make some shadows here. So this is another thing, Ritika, that you could have done to add some dimension is uh, making shadows in these places so that you can tell that there is a step here. This is not a fully black color. It's a mix of the roof tile color that we used 
So just yellow ochre and black and a little extra black for the front these steps. And again, don't you can make them in one shot also, or you can make them like this. So leave a little gap between these steps. And again, you can use a little black just at the base of those steps. Now, unless you are absolutely comfortable making the texture of cobblestones, avoid it. They're too tiny and too cumbersome to paint. Now the bench over here is actually in some kind of white cement or white wood, but I think we can safely paint it a mix of yellow ochre and burnt sienna. So it looks like this wood here. And it doesn't get completely lost in the picture because if we make that white like we've made the or the same color as the steps, it'll just get lost. So this was burnt, burnt sienna and yellow ochre. And I'll use that same color for the wooden doors. I don't know how I missed making this door. I can see the color in some places, but not in the others. I don't know why. So it's burnt sienna and yellow ochre. Now, while I do give you suggestions for colors, I would really like it if you just try to figure these out yourselves and try them out. You would never know what color is the right color, but uh, there may not be just one right color, one way to go about it. For example, if you land up mixing yellow ochre and scarlet because you think it's pretty red, paint it. If it looks too red, make a second layer with a little less red or something like that. You can always make adjustments. Now here, after you've painted this once, it, everything lands up looking fairly flat. But see, all these color mixes are quite beautiful for our paint. Uh, sorry, our um, uh, painting. So you don't want to go over these too much. So in that case, now we can just use a little color, um, the same color, yellow ochre, burnt sienna, and add a little black or burnt umber to that and paint a few sections dark where we might see shadows. So usually the shadows would be not on the panel that are, they, uh, are at the bottom, but at the top. And any one side also maybe. And then also Along the bottom edge of these section separators. I know it's very subtle, but the eye will definitely catch all these things. Right underneath these flags. Just part of that can be a little darker. You don't need to make it all over. You can make it between the doors which you identified as doors. And the same color can also come here on top, just on this side. Right? 
Not at the bottom, but maybe the sides. And now if you have the patience for this, you can take on the tedious task of making dark patches between these slats. So just observe, I'm using the thinnest brush I have. That's a zero, I think. And I'm going to see the brush is turned sideways like that. It's not at a point. So I use that to my advantage and just paint along one side of the line that we've drawn. And it gives me uh, an even line throughout, but it does not fill up the whole space. So the negative space will give me the illusion of uh, a rod. So while we drew it as just straight lines, when we are painting it, we can finish that illusion. Again, this will add to the sense of detail in your picture. And ideally, all details must be made on top of your washes always. See, instantly now I've got more depth. A same blue green uh, blue black color for the shadows on the lower roof. Now I notice that I tend to move um, my brush much faster than many students, and I notice this only when I I have the in person class. And uh, in order to be able to move the brush faster and more accurately, I would recommend that all of you start drawing with the brush. Like making some patterns or a very tedious design, like in my mother's word, a very kid's cut design. I think I'm going to put that, I'm going to make that an English word, kid's cut. Because it's not, I can't describe it, what, what that means. It's not tedious. It's not really difficult. It's pretty easy. But you need a certain mad tenacity to go about it, at least according to my mother. Okay, do you see any development? Do you see how things are looking more distinct now? Yes, thank you. Good. <laughs> All right. Now, um, for the food bit today, I was wondering whether you guys want to try making a collage because last week we made these beautiful stickers. And uh, if you want to, if you can, if you have spare drawing paper, or you can just take out some paper from the back of your book and have it ready. I have a rough sheet that I have used before. We can illustrate food on the rough paper, cut it up, and paste it on what I want to make over here. I want to make a pattern. Like in Alka's case, I think today Alka is not here. She already has a pattern made. So her page is pretty filled up. You can't really make more on that. But it is always fun to make little, little things and paste them all over the place. So for, for those of you who do have space here, let's make a print of the, maybe a wave print. So give me a minute. I'm going to put in some reference images of the prints while you all finish this.
There's one print I particularly enjoy making. Okay, I've just shared that image. Uh, Aditi, yeah. are you going to write uh, the title like the Japan here on the page or how do you have it in your mind or how do you want to? Uh, well, I don't really have it in my mind right now. Okay. But my go-to is uh, usually to paste if nothing else, if I don't have space, if I fill up everything else. But okay. if, you, if you would like to, then just identify a spot. Now okay. we have the, um, does anyone know if the Japanese script is written top to bottom or left to right? Top to bottom. It is top to bottom, right? So here yeah. we have a rare opportunity to be able to also write Japan like that. Like that, yeah. One on top of the other. Mm -hmm. Or it can also be written over here or over here. It does not have to be horizontal. Horizontal. Yeah. So we could use that as um, an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we can, in the rest of the page, we can do all sorts of stuff. Plus, we can also cut up those letters and write them to paste them one on top of the other. Like, end. yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So just make sure whatever you're pasting, avoid pasting in the center. Center. Whether it's over here or whether it's in your book, because then it does not fold very well and it just lands up damaging the spine of the book. So you don't want to do that. So when we are making this print, we can make this print in an area somewhere like this. Don't fill up the whole place. Again, that is very boring and very predictable. So just make the print somewhere over here. Let it just flow out into whatever. And then we will place the other elements, maybe a little bottle of uh, all that little cask of uh, sake, some sushi or whatever all over this place. And then we can write Japan here. Okay. These are the prints that I found. These are some very generic prints. All of these have some very interesting names and uh, purposes. And I'll share that article with you. I can't, I, I thought there were just about six or eight prints and I thought I'll read and I'll memorize, but no chance. So I just gave up completely. So this, this print on top, I really like making. It's It looks very simple, but there is a certain complexity to the design. And um, we can make it like this, or we can make it in reverse. The choice is yours. We can uh, construct it first in rough, and then we can um, make it in fair. Even the second one is just peaceful waves, that is also a nice print to make. Uh, I don't know which one to make now. Uh, it's it's easier to just be given one and said, now do this. Even this is very cute. And there's a hexagonal one. Yeah, this fellow is supposed to represent um, turtle shell. So it's supposed to give strength or something like that. Very beautiful meanings. And this must be that wave. Uh, these are cherry blossom flowers. I don't know what this is. And these are on the bottom right are walnut flowers. I think that that was what I read. Anyway, so I'll show you the construction of the, the one on the top left. And uh, I'll also give you the name because then we can note that down. We can make the construction right on the back of the same page. Don't waste too much pages, too many pages for this. So first off, start off with just making a well-organized box. Don't make the pattern without a box. Even the back of your work should look uh, very elegant. Okay, now make a line that runs through the center of the box. Divide the two halves again into half. So you have 
three lines which cut the box vertically into four sections. Now, we won't make horizontal lines, but we'll make a dot in the center of the center line and a dot at center on the sides, vertical center. Then we will make a dot at one quarter in the lines in between these lines. So you have staggered lines and then back again on the corners. So this will this will remind you, those of you who have done Rangori will remind you of that kind of pattern. All right. Now from the top center, you can draw a line diagonally on both sides. And run a line again diagonal from the corners. And again from here. So basically all the lines are connected on the diagonal. Now at this point, we will identify a dot at half the section, half of each section next to its corresponding dot. So let, let me show you just one side here. This is that half section. I have to make a triangle in this space. That is what I have to do. So this is my basic type. And the video is frozen, Aditi. Is it? For me, it's okay. Oh, not for him. Yeah, it's fine. Uh oh, okay. For me, it's okay. All right, Tarini, are you there? Okay, so all the others, you have to do the same thing. Just keep looking at the pattern. In this case, in the case of this, we again, it's the same thing. And where now, how do we do it on the top? Yeah, halfway there. So it doesn't, this line won't come horizontally. I think this goes here. Okay, this is one way of going about it. The other way is you draw another shape in between. Now we've got one, two, three, four lines. One, two, three lines. You draw lines from half the. I don't know if this will help. And then you connect these to the corners. This is the only, I think, topic or only way I can understand maths and geometry. Give me a pattern to solve. And because I have nothing better to do in life, I will figure out many ways of trying to create the same pattern over and over and over again. And it's super fun, I can tell you that. And being able to predict a pattern. Just uh, on Wednesday, we did a page on Bhutan. And in that, there was um, 
there was a, a basket weave. What fun I had making that basket weave. I'll show you. No, it's going to come lower. I think this is very complicated. Let's just make the wave. That's going to be easier. Trying to draw this and paint it, this will take us till tomorrow. So now you know, or you don't know, or you know what you don't know. Either way, it's a good thing. We can come back to this. I've already shared the image, so you know how you might be able to construct it. Let's go ahead and make that wave pattern. So for this again, I maybe what we can I can recommend is uh, instead of painting the sections in between, which takes a long time, we can just start making a subtle pattern on one side. So you could start off with measured waves on one corner. Ideally, don't make it flat. Don't make it horizontal. And always start, if you have a very regular pattern, make it from the center towards the periphery. Like here, I won't start from the side because often the sides will be compromised and you make some mistakes. But the center sections are generally complete. So much better to, or much dependable, much more dependable. So your only job here is to maintain the height and the width of these scallop shapes. Make only the scallop shape in pencil and then make the design in paint. The design will have two or three consecutive lines inside of these scallop shapes. Now, I would think so much is enough because when we paste something on top here and here, maybe we won't, uh, we won't see the rest. So you don't bother with that. And again, I personally don't like when a design that you're trying to make or a pattern that you're trying to make on a paper is made in a flat edge. A flat edge is, uh, is something that we have to do if we're not making the pattern by hand. But because you're making by hand, we don't need to keep any ends unfinished or finished to um, to a, a hard edge. Okay, now again, if you're not sure about this, take the back of your page first try making the pattern there see if you like how it looks and only after that proceed to the paper you are not nobody's holding a gun to your head to say you have to make this pattern so always make sure that you are enjoying this pattern on your paper freely use the diary or your book for this exploration. Now this pattern can be made three, four ways. You can make the pattern go up or you can turn your book around and make the pattern come down. See what line is easier for you. You could also keep it sideways and make C shapes. Because you're making it with a brush, different ways will work differently. Okay, so let's see this. Once you've made the pattern in pencil, you will have probably made it very uh, regular. 
So this is the practice that gives you a good hand. This is what I was telling you about achieving speed and accuracy when painting with the brush. So very tiny places where you need to make shadows can seem daunting and you may take much longer than is necessary simply because your hand does not just have the experience of moving freely in a very defined space. So in a way, I would say this is like, uh, have you guys must have seen those dog training competitions where these dogs are given very precise, specific instructions to, I think, walk or run on a path. And they are constantly looking at their handler or their trainer and following instructions. And they know exactly what to do in a very complicated obstacle path. In some way, this is dog training for your hand. It has to follow that path. You have to be in charge of this line, not the brush. So move the book around and find a position that is most comfortable for you. That way you can ensure that halfway through the print, you are not going to suddenly slip your hand off of the edge. Or suddenly there's an obstacle. So while you saw that I made this pattern, holding the book upright, it is so much easier making the print sideways painting it with a brush. The tool makes a big difference. I'm going to try holding it the other way around because I want to see how my pattern looks while I'm making it. Those of you who can see how your pattern is developing, whichever way you're holding it, continue to hold it that way. You don't need to change it just because I changed it. So I realized that when I was holding it the other way around and I made my pattern coming to the left, my hand was covering my design. So I could only see what I have to do. Now that I've turned it the other way around, I can see how the pattern is developing and I can continue to look at it because I need to make all the scallop designs as even as possible. So the pattern is not super accurate. All the all the scallop lines and details are not exactly one on top of the other. And like I always say that for a handmade design, that's cute. Some of my uh, scallops have three lines, some have four lines. But I'm trying to maintain the negative space as even as possible. Nobody will be able to tell if I made four or five lines within my scallop. But an eye will easily be able to detect if some of my lines are closer and some of my lines are further apart.
In this case also, when you are building a pattern, I recommend coming from outside to inside. That's a larger space, so you need to maintain uniformity on the out, outer periphery, uniformity of space distribution. If you start from inside, there's a chance that you might not end up exactly central to the curve. You might not have space. But from outside to inside, it matters little. Tarani, are you back? Yes, yes, Aditi, I'm here. Okay, okay. You, did you miss anything? No, no, I caught up. All yeah. right, okay. Okay, now, can we move to the food? I'll just put this away. Just keeping these together, so I want to see how everything is coming up. Nice. So I'm using this sheet of paper from just a rough sheet that I used to use for as a protector. And we will start making the food. So the food also we will make with the kind of casual lines that we've made over here, just so that everything matches. Let me share the image so I can show you what is happening but I'm going to share it with my screen so you can see both well enough. This looks like a very nice well organized Japanese meal all sorts of stuff in it and we don't have to worry about what all these things are. We have to just pick and choose what we want to make from it. Um, I've seen a lot of images of these triangular rice things. What are they called? Uh, oni, oni something. Onigiri. Onigiri, correct. Uh, then there was this very nice... Uh, I like this because it had an array of a lot of things like a Japanese thali. But also it was on what looked like a bamboo plate or a tray. So that brings it a little authentic... Or what I imagine is authentic Japanese also. I don't know how much that is. And then I got these lovely barrels of sake. Now, packaging is, I think Japanese people have done brilliant packaging. I wish I could read the script to enjoy it. But they have, even traditionally, they have such wonderful packaging ideas, strings to tie up stuff, uh, very nice, um, usually cloth or some kind of, very interesting binding, folding, cutting, pasting. They are just masters. So we can recreate all of these. And since we are going to make it in a collage format, we can literally make as many different things as we want, cut and paste them individually on our sheet. So in this case, now we can make the central um, tray, which has all these uh, unigiri, and color them up. This is very fast to make. Then we can make individual bowls of all of these as well. Cut and paste. And one 
nice jar or cask of sake. That's that's very difficult to say. Cask of sake. Cask of sake. Oh my god. Okay. Let's get on with it. <laughs> One minute, I've lost my pens. Okay, so directly use a pen. Don't use a pencil at all. You can make triangular shapes, right? So I'm using, is, is my screen uh, visible? Both screens visible and you can see the drawing bit, right? Okay. So keeping the style casual, First, first, we will make the triangular shapes. And the less straight your lines are, the better your illustration will look. So here we go. Make a wobbly line. And in that, you can make, I don't know what this is. It could be uh, black sesame or some spices or god knows what you don't really have to know what it is you have to just look at it and draw what you see then make the next one oh it has to be a little rounder on the side okay i'll make it rounder for some reason this piece makes me uh, reminds me of a sumo wrestler like the the thing that they wear, their own langot like thing. <laughs> it yeah. Looks, you know? <laughs> so true. <laughs> I mean, now that piece looks like a sumo wrestler to me. <laughs> it does, no? <laughs> <laughs> now, this piece of sauce that you have on the third top one, just make a silhouette. And around some places, just make these like little curve lines so that will look like a shadow in the sauce don't do too much more don't try to draw full lines and shapes of those shadows now this one will have some straight lines because it is wrapped in seaweed And I have made double lines in a lot of places, but this one, I have to make it look like it is seaweed wrapped. So I'm deliberately making a second line around it, which is straighter. And again, use slightly straighter lines for the topping on this piece so that it looks different from the one we made before. This is not a sauce. This looks like a, some pickled vegetables. So your lines can make a, a very convincing illusion. Anything can be made convincing just with the number of lines, the kind of line that you made, where you made it. That's usually enough. Now in this one, you can make a much more textured line because it is completely filled up with toasted sesame seeds and one trick that I use for this and also when I'm making things like rice is make a few grains along the edge so it looks like it is completely covered in some seeds and keep make some overlapping, some um, changing their direction, their size. Don't make the same thing over and over. And we don't have to draw all of them. We can also paint them and also even just indicate them like this. Now we can make a tray around this. Now, this is my trick of making a tray with rounded edges. I'll make this. I'm not making the handle, though it does seem to have a handle. I'm just giving that up. 
make the vertical and horizontal lines on all four sides, but don't make the corners. Make the corners afterwards. And I'll try it slightly crooked. So I can straighten it. And I will make this side look like there's a shadow. If I don't acknowledge that it's a mistake, it is not a mistake. It's like uh, bribery in India. If you don't get caught, it's not bribery. It's incentive. <laughs> Okay, now, just so that we are sure that we've not made our proportions too off, see where your illustration is going to appear and how large it is. This is pretty large. But we can make this fun. We can also consider overlapping. So we have this, then we can have another picture overlapping this, another picture here, and that cask of sake over here. So everything can look like a nice busy market, food marketplace. If you want, you can also make these smaller, but at any point, keep checking that what you're making is going to fit in the space that you want it to fit. Uh, don't cut it before painting because it's a big bother trying to hold your piece uh, while when it is cut and trying to paint all over the place. So uh, before we start painting this, let us make at least one dish from the other bowl. Maybe the, the soup bowl. That might work. So here again, follow, follow just the lines. You can make a very odd circular-ish shape for this also. Make a rim. Just make it confidently and wherever it touches, it touches. Now, let's make a bowl that is uh, roundish towards the bottom of the page, not the side as is seen in this picture. I have a feeling that this picture has been clicked with a lens that allows to cover a lot of space within that skews perspective. Now we have to show that this soup is just below the rim on the top. But you see that it is, you can't indicate that on the uh, bottom side or the edge that is closer to us. So just follow the shapes that you see. I see like a carrot shape with some 3D over here, some kind of noodle. That's just basically parallel lines. Then there's some sliver of either meat or tofu or whatever. The less you think about what it is, the better your art will be. That seems very silly, but that's how it works. That's why foreign foods are fairly easy to draw. If the same thing were like a amti or some kind of dal or dal fry or something, we would be thinking so much about, Adi, this is a bean, I should make it look like a bean. And that's where all our shapes go all over the place. Here, we don't know what it is. It may look like one thing. It could be another thing. And it could be something that we've never seen of before also. So we land up having, maintaining a certain objectivity. Many of these things in art, I find very ironic or counterintuitive. One might think that familiarity would be an asset. But for beginners, familiarity can be a disadvantage. So there are lots of lines even in these little, little shapes, whatever they are. 
you can make some of the those lines also but just make a few of them don't make too many don't you just need to indicate a few things now one thing to remember those of you who are in the habit of drawing tentatively and are not connecting your lines will find that your soup looks like it's disjointed uh, let me demonstrate what i mean the same soup some of you are in all probability drawing like this Lines are not touching. So this is a very tentative line. This line is fine if you're going to make a soup that is very milky and you want to show that you can see elements underneath the soup or something like that so i'm not going to say that this line is wrong but it will not give you the kind of contrast that we see in this picture is anyone making these kind of lines no okay good and sometimes not touching the edge these shapes Now, just on the top edge, you can make a line that gives us the edge of the soup along the top edge. That's the opposite side of the depth of the bowl that we see. And just for fun, we can make a pair of chopsticks in this space on the side because we can cut them oh i was going to make them opposite directions but i don't think that would be right and just so that they can be seen as 3d i'm making a, a line very close to one edge, rounding it off at the top so that it looks like that's the edge of the chopsticks. Okay, how's everyone doing? Do you still need time or you're with me? With you. Good, good, very good. All right, first things first, we need to make the bases. So let's use a yellow ochre, or you can use this shade, yellow ochre with black, but less black. You could brighten this up a little bit with gamboge. You won't see it as gamboge, but it'll give some vibrancy. Uh, this is becoming too yellowish. Okay, let's add a little burnt sienna. And now a little yellow ochre, right. So this is a suitably uh, warm color for both our trays, our tray and our bowl. And using a nice big brush, we can paint this. But first, 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 without painting that first, let's first make the shadows on the rice using this blue-black color. So I don't have to do that later on. Uh, wash along the bottom and the left side. And definitely on the bottom of the condiments that are kept on top as well. In some cases, your wash can go over the rice as well, but not the whole thing. So just in a few places, you can smush your brush into the rice.
make a little shadow along the bottom as well. With this can be done later too. So you don't really need to make it right now if you don't want to. While the, uh, oh, oh, what is it called in there? Oni, Oniagi, Onagi. Onigiri. Onigiri. I better write it down. I don't know, I can't remember this. Onigiri. <laughs> that has just now become part of lore, I think. It's just so much easier to remember. Okay, so painting the soup bowl. Now, in this case, we do the opposite of what we did in the building. Here, you can add a deeper color as you come down. We have done this before, so it should be easy enough for all of you. Into this color, you can take a little burnt umber mix of the same shade and make vertical strokes and pull this down. So in one shot, you are able to create a slightly deeper shade towards the bottom. And let it dry. Don't do too much musty with this. You can use the same color to paint the chopsticks. And if the rice has uh, dried, use that same color, maybe a little extra yellow ochre and maybe with a fat brush, depending upon the size of your illustration, make the base now. Remember when you're making the base, point the brush in the direction of the edge. So you can always see the edge that you are painting. And keep your turning your piece around frequently. Since we have made these shadows, don't linger because you will dislodge the shadows. Stay in the paper and move on. Now check if your soup bowl has dried and we will just start putting different shades of color wherever you see them. Like over here, it's a little mix of lemon yellow and yellow ochre. So make that, then the piece of garlic or something underneath that. So all this section seems to have these shades and then they move into slightly more orange shades. So with food, you will encounter some foods where the color is weird. You don't know what to make. But there will be some foods where you can instantly say what the color is and make that. So by sheer process of elimination, you will be able to finish most of your 
painting accurately by attacking the colors that you know. So in the case of these, what look like pieces of meat, it's a very weird shade that you might have to make. It's got some pink, it's got some yellow ochre, then it's got a slightly grayish tone. So I'm taking literally small section here, which is scarlet, little bit of yellow ochre and a little bit of black and mixing that together to create the weird fresh flesh tint I see. And in this case, it helps to just trust your eyes. You will also be able to paint some negative spaces like these, the noodles from uh, underneath the noodles that we've drawn are also visible, maybe not as harsh edges. So you can just paint, paint those lines like we have painted the uh, pattern. Now, as you go to smaller and smaller areas, Start reducing the size of your brush. And in this case, now again, don't make a flat orange for the carrot. Take a mix of gamboge and orange. And paint first in a slightly lightish color. And then you can come back with a deeper color and paint one edge. So instant dimensioning. What looks like a cooked bean here can be used to give us a highlight. So don't paint the whole bean flat. Leave a little bit of that highlight visible. And also put a little dark patch there. Seems to be some green here also. Once you've filled all the colors in, now comes the fun bit. Make a mix of black and burnt umber so you get a nice deep color. So it's almost like a deep chocolate brown color. Use a light shade of that, not too much. I'll show you the shade. This is its normal shade, but I'm wiping that away and using an even lighter shade of this color, burnt umber and black. I'm getting this lighter and lighter shade by just wiping my brush away. So just creating some residual paint and run that along the edges of some of the meats that we have created just to give them depth just along the edges of all the elements between the lines create these shadows just on the edge of some of the shapes because this depth will not be otherwise palpable all the objects will look like they've been stuck to the top I know this looks very tiny, but believe me, these are the things that separate our illustration. And now we can use the darker version or deeper version of this color to fill in the soup. But we need the soup to look like it is nice and uh, fresh. So don't go to the edge. Leave a few parts 
shiny. Let me just show you. So few parts of the soupy bit will be left unpainted or much lighter. This is the same color, burnt umber and black, but more towards the black. Now here I have the opportunity of creating a highlight. Here I have the opportunity of creating noodles. So I'll do that, but with shadow. So I'm imagining where certain um, items might be. Some I can see in the picture. And that black color of the soup is going through and through our soup. So you can't miss out on a few places. Okay, it was just three minutes left for officially class to finish, but I think this is going to take a little longer. So those of you who need to leave at 11, you can leave and watch the video afterwards. Uh, if some of you can wait, then I'd like to complete this part and at least put it up on our page. The same color can be used to intensify the shadows in even the onigiri as a second layer of shadows. The same color with a little bit of burnt uh, sienna can be used for this condiment here. And again, in all of these, you don't put a flat color. Make this, make a few places of highlight, wait, come back and paint some darker colors. I burnt sienna with crimson now for the... Wait, we need to make a pink rice. I didn't realize this rice was pink. So just a little bit of... Uh, What's it? Crimson. A crimson wash should be fine. And again, I feel that there seems to be some, some texture over there. So not the whole thing would not be pink. There would be some white patches. And the last one is uh, so full of these lines that we can paint it a little bit with the same color that we use for the soup here, but a little burnt, more burnt umber. So I'm giving it an overall shade of brown. Likewise, a brownish green for an overall shade here. If we sit and make each and every 
grain of whatever they have put onto these pieces, it'll take us till forever. So I suppose just choose your battles. And of course, our sumo wrestler right on top. I love that little thing. It just seems like such an efficient way to pack rice. You can hold it and put it in your mouth and nothing is going to happen. And such a such a Japanese way of doing it also. Okay, before I forget, I started off with a green shade, if you can see. This is a mix of sap green with black, blue, all sorts of stuff. This is the shade that I had made here. Just take some deep colors and create a deep green color. And then as I painted it towards the bottom, I added a little bit of black to that. So as far as possible, don't make flat colors. Insert new colors freely. And don't worry about the outcome. Okay, in this case, I'm painting strokes on this side and flat on the bottom left. It's much redder than I would like, but forget it. Let it be. It looks quite nice. We can use the same green black combination for the seaweed wrapping. Definitely leave black uh, certain sections unpainted for highlights. Without highlights, uh, everything looks reasonably well, not reasonably, it looks quite flat. And you can use any color to create shadows for this condiment also. Now there seems to be some beautiful carving pattern on the base of the of the onigiri and uh, if you want to make that even at this stage, you could shift to maybe something like color pencil and try to make that pattern very casually. So it looks like they are oval shapes that they're carved out. And in keeping with the kind of pattern that we made on which this is going to go and sit. You need not make the whole pattern. You could just make a little bit. Or you could make the whole one. So for practical terms, all these patterns can be started out when you are making the illustration. But you can finish them in the during the waiting periods and this is I'm by this I mean when you're traveling there will be times when you'll have to just sit and do nothing at one point because your flight is delayed and they won't tell you how much it's delayed by and you can get frustrated or just keep looking at the monitor or start making these textures and I have it from several of my students that now they look forward to flight delays and uh, waiting rooms. Nothing seems to face them. And wouldn't you want to be in that position? I mean, I know I do. I, I love that I can, I'm a good waiter. Oh, well, that didn't come out right. <laughs> I can wait well. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Now for this soup bowl, I can see that it's looking rather dull. So we can add more color in a second layer for the outside. 
and uh, this also looks like a wooden bowl so if you have the tenacity for it you can make a few shapes like these and paint like a wooden texture we have done this and later in the year we will be doing more materials so i'll be i'll show you how to paint wood as well but it is not too difficult even now you just make some patterns in different types of browns and the inside of the bowl you can make a deep color so just around the food you can make it deep in the photograph, this entire section looks very deep. So you can make that whole thing deep as well. But I'd rather make it only in one, maybe two sides. Keep part of it light as if there is some highlight there. And I would add some more texture to this wood. Uh, this has started looking like salmon now. Okay, never mind. All right, so now let's cut it up. So there is, of course, a lot more we can do in this. But let's cut this and see how this looks. And um, in, in this remaining page, you can make the sake, uh, sake cask, sake cask. Okay. Now, usually I keep some space between the edge and the drawing, even if it's very tiny, because I like the look of stickers. Oh, yeah, by the way, stickers are a big thing, I think, in Japan, stickers and stamps. So we have managed to somehow tap into that part of their contemporary culture by making sticker-like illustrations. I had not intended that. I wish I had planned that. Who shared last week about that uh, stationary festival that everyone wants Dai to go to? They had so many stamps there. I would probably want to go just for the stationary festival. Where is that one happening? Do you remember? Oh, it's there. It's in our, uh, if you just go back now. Art from home group. Yeah. Did Dai put it or uh, somebody else or Ritika? No, I didn't put it. Yeah, no, I didn't. Oh, wait a minute. Then is it there on this? <laughs> I'll find it. I'll find it. I'll find it. Okay, so here we have it. And we can also shift this around. We can keep them at an angle. The choice is yours, whatever you want to do. And just because we've made the print over here does not mean that you have to have it visible at all points. You can, if this is the best place that you can keep the uh, onigiri tray, then keep it over here. You can keep it this way as well. And you can keep it like this. So play around with it before you decide on the composition. And if you want to wait till you make that cask of sake to paste these also. Whenever you are doing a paste up thing, you should have all the elements that you need before you do the pasting. Otherwise, you, you'll always see that I wish this was below, that was above, whatever. Um, what else? Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, do you have any questions? I'm going to make that sake thing 
later, hopefully later today and place it. I will make a, a not stop motion, whatever, whatever that thing is, time lapse video of it. So you can at least follow how it was done. And then everyone can make it together. This was really fun. Panna? Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you the page that I did for Bhutan. It's turned out really beautiful. It's just to show you that if you give it time and take more time to finish your pages, keep going back to the page. Wow. This is so beautiful. It's turned out exceptional, if I may say so. Even I've enjoyed it. This is amazing. <laughs> and you can, you will be able to make everything. So I'm going to share the link to this, these two classes. We did this in the Wednesday class. But try doing this. Here is another nerdy design. It's very mathematical. We had super fun making this in class also. And um, again, these are the things which my brain is occupied with trying to figure out. That's why I know no gossip and I have no friends. But it's super fun to make. I'm on your path. <laughs> <laughs> so the things that work in this page, I'll, I'll maybe I can indicate why some things work and some things don't work. To some extent, it is composition. And within the composition, also color matters. I get affected by color. So you notice that the, the, the color is reasonably well distributed. And this was not by design. This was something that happened very instinctively. So I will tell you the process of how you can go about it. You don't need excessive planning. So start with a limited palette of colors. My palette was defined by these flag colors. These were part of the photograph. The same colors I saw reflected in the monastery, same colors in the flag, and these colors were very different. This was almost like a maroon. This was a deep, a horrible bluish green. You know, the synthetic colors that often bamboo is dyed with. And this was actually pink. But had I made it in those colors, then it might have still looked good because the pattern turned out really nice. But I don't know. But in this case, if you just look at the finished picture, you can see how there are colors talking to each other. You have the yellow talking in all these places. So one, two, three in a nice harmony. Then you have the green talking to each other. One, two, three, nice harmony. Similarly, the red, one, one, two, three, four, five. That is happening. So, uh, and also you have blue, you have a little blue here, a little blue here, and that's enough. So the overwhelmingly, it's about reds and yellows and greens, and that reflects very well in the monastery picture. So that is, I think, how this worked out. Also, when I'm writing the text, I was wondering whether I should write Tiger Nest Monastery over here, or I should write its original name. And I felt for me, if I were seeing a page about Pune, I would want the local name to be more uh, important. And that's why I wrote this in a color that reflects from the monastery and not blue and kept the blue or just as the nickname or popular internationally known name or something that people can pronounce in on the side. So it's there, but it's not interfering too much or eating into the space. It's just aiding. And also interesting negative spaces. Mm. Leave, mm. leave some mm. patches un, unfinished. I could have easily gone on and on and made this rock face look like rock, but there's really no need. This is enough. We don't need to clearly say this is a rock. Huh? This is not a boat. This is not anything else. No, you don't need that. So allow for that little to happen. Okay, so do check this out. 
I will share this. So the uh, what I finished is part of the bamboo basket. Then I told everyone to do that at home. One chili, then everything was done at home. But the flag I is very complicated. You may or may not want to do it. This one is not in the recording. So you will see everything other than the text. This mm -hmm. So the important parts are all there. Okay, at least do that. And then the rest, then you can ask me and I'll help you out. Okay, so, oh, I'm sorry. What am I doing? Hmm. If you can finish this page in, on Japan, next week we can take up another city or another country. So anyone else traveling anywhere else who needs a page? I'm also going Anguilla, Caribbean. What? Stop it. <laughs> but it's the office who is sending me. <laughs> I don't care. Whoever is telling you enough. <laughs> Where is it? Ang Anguilla. Yeah, it's in. Uh, it's it's just along the West Indies. Uh, it's the uh, British territory. Uh, but it's it's. I mean, I have seen. It's the not Antigua. Anguilla. 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 I've never heard about this. Okay. <laughs> I also didn't heard it unless they sent me the location that you know we have a conference here and you have to visit. I said which place and. From India, it's like 24 hour flight I have to take. Wonderful. We have a Let's take a page. <laughs> what kind of conference is this? I know. So really sent I... me such an exotic place. Look at the beach. Wow. Yeah. Wonderful. So we... I got the top performance award. So that's why I've been invited to that. Otherwise, I would not have got that opportunity. Very good. Very nice. Okay, so let's make a page on Anguilla. Let's find out. Anyway, we don't know anything about it. We don't know anything about they will have some interesting food, some baskets or something. You never know. If it's a British territory, they will have mixed ancestry with Indians, African yeah. Americans. No, no, not Americans. Africans and Africans, yes. Okay. And Hispanics. Yeah, there could yeah. be lots of stuff. Yeah, find out now. Find out. Put it on the group. Let's let's make it's a... near West Indies. You said. Hmm. Yeah, okay. it looks like on the map yeah, near West Indies. Martin. Hmm. Okay. I just Google it. It's like one of the best islands. Yeah, and I, like I just did Angula art. <laughs> it's pulling up postcards. All right, yeah. nice, please share your references and uh, whatever you all have seen right now on the group immediately, and we shall yes. do it next week. Yeah. Okay. Chalo, see you then. Bye, everyone. Have a nice weekend. Thank you you Thank too. You. Thanks. Bye. Bye.